welcome to Stuff You Should Know from HowStuffWorks.com. Hey, and welcome to the podcast. I'm Josh Clark, and there's Charles W. Chuck Bryant, and there's nobody else because this is <laughs> just pitiful, man. Ghost producers left and right. Yep. Does, does it bum you out to be... I'm just going to come out and admit it. Yes, a little <laughs> bit. It just it just makes the whole thing feel so workmanlike and unimportant. You with, know? Yeah, with just you and me in here. It's uh I mean, I'm happy to be here with you, but I, oh, I you know, I like that. like um yeah, you know, it's just No, I'm just, with you. It's just another thing that has to be done, record Josh and Chuck. It's not an event anymore, you know? There's no streamers like there used to be. Nobody cares. Well, luckily, the people who are listening care. Yes. And you really have to care if you listened to an episode about roundabouts. You know, it's funny that you picked this one because just two days ago, Mm -hmm. I was driving home, went through a roundabout in uh, the neighborhood of Lake Clare. Okay. And I was like, I love roundabouts. I love roundabouts. I wish Atlanta had more. And Atlanta has its a decent amount now, uh, a lot of them newer. But uh, I, I was just thinking about how much I loved roundabouts. And then the next day, you said, let's do one on roundabouts. That's really interesting, man. Yeah. That is, I like that kind of, um, uh, not syncretism. That's where Catholicism and indigenous religious beliefs mer- merge. I can't remember what it's called, but... Um, Synchronicity, that's what it is. I like that kind of stuff. Yeah. So I'm right there with you, man. I love roundabouts too. Mm -hmm. And here's why. To me, the second worst thing in the world after slow driving people in the fast lane, which by the way, you can see my Twitter feed, Josh underscore um, underscore Clark for how I feel about um, slow drivers in the fast lane. I have have a feeling I know what you're about to say, but go ahead. The second, mm-hmm. the second worst thing that could possibly happen to a human being mm-hmm. is to sit there <laughs> at a red light when oh. there's no traffic coming. Okay, that's not what I thought you were going to say. What did you think I was going to say? I thought you were going to say people who do not know how to manage a four-way stop sign stop. Uh, that, is that third? That's, yeah, that's, <laughs> I'll, I'll put that third. Yeah, you're right. I'll put that third, man. Yeah, but it is annoying sitting at a traffic light, and it's even more annoying these days when you sit for an extra three seconds at every stoplight because everyone is just finishing up that email. Oh, man. Yeah, that drives me crazy. I I do. I'm so quick on the horn now. I used to be very polite and just like a little, hey, you might not notice, tap, tap. But now Mm -hmm. when I see that head down, I just lay it on thick. I cannot tell you how proud I am of you right now. (laughs) It's really like, I love it. And I usually scream some expletive, Attached Man. to get off your phone. Chuck, you are really coming along, buddy. <laughs> I appreciate it. I'm trying I to remember, be more aggressive. I remember one time when we were driving together years and years ago, and I was doing that. I was, like, shouting at people and stuff, and you're like, really? Are we doing this? <laughs> and I was like, yeah, isn't this normal? And then now to hear that you're you're doing the same thing, I'm, I'm glad. I'm actually dialing it back. Oh, and okay. apparently it's just kind of transferred over and made its way to you. Yeah. I guess it's one of those things like um, anger in a car can neither be created nor destroyed. It just goes from person <laughs> to person, you know? I just got no patience for cell phones and driving. None. Agreed. I'm over it. Well, that's another great thing. It's a it's a great thing slash dangerous thing about introducing roundabouts. The idea that people are on their phones now more than ever while they're driving. Um, which, again, if you're doing that, just 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 stop. Just stop. That's so dangerous. It's so reckless and irresponsible. Stop doing that, okay? Yeah. The problem is, is if you if you have people on phones and you introduce roundabouts, it's good and it's bad. It's a double-edged sword. It's good because if they have even a shred of uh, survival instinct, they'll just drop their phone right to the floorboard and grab the wheel with both hands in terror and panic because suddenly something's different and they have to really pay attention. That's one of the great things about a roundabout. It makes you pay attention, right? Oh, for sure. The problem Ideally. is— Ideally. 
Ideally, if you don't have that survival instinct and you don't drop your phone, then all of a sudden conditions suddenly change and you might find yourself in an accident with somebody else. Fortunately, roundabouts are designed so that the accident will be minimal compared to one that you may have gotten into at a lighted intersection. For sure. Uh, However, there is a newer roundabout over in Emory Village. I don't know if you've seen that one yet. No. No. And that Emory Village is, is tough because it was – and it needed one because it's – I don't know how many points. I feel like it's a – like one of those kind of weird five-way intersections. Mm-hmm. So those kinds of intersections are screaming for roundabouts. Right. So they finally built one. It's very pretty, very functional. But uh, just yesterday, I was driving through that one thinking, I love roundabouts. And this <laughs> dude just barreled through and did not yield, almost hit me. Uh-huh. And I had a few choice words for him. Yep. But I'm like, roundabouts to me are so intuitive. Our article says they're counterintuitive. I disagree. I did too. I think there's nothing more intuitive than not to just go barreling into a a whirly go round circle of cars, which this guy did. <laughs> right. But what's what's ironic is if if he had done that in say like the 1950s in the United States. He would have been in the right. You would have been in the wrong. Which is just crazy to me when it I read is. that. Do you want to do? You want to start with some history about roundabouts? Because believe it or not, everybody they have some history. Yeah, I mean, should we quickly say what they are? <laughs> oh, yeah. We're doing that thing again. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. So a roundabout is um, frequently called a traffic circle over in the UK, and I think in other parts of Europe they call it a gyratory, a one-way gyratory. <laughs> of course they do. Um, and sometimes previously they were called rotaries, but what it is is. It is a, instead of an intersection where, say, two or more roads cross, rather than just having it be all right angles, you take that intersection and kind of break it out and put a circle in the middle. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, everybody going through that intersection has to go around the circle. Whether you want to go right, straight, left, or do a U-turn, you've got a circle to, to circumnavigate. And there's a lot of reasons to do this. It slows people down. It makes them pay attention, ideally. Um, it cuts down on congestion. And um, I think it's just much safer than a, a lighted intersection. So that's, that's what a roundabout is. And a roundabout specifically also, Chuck, it's a, um, it's a specific kind of this traffic implementation. It has it has specific traits that we'll talk about that make it unique among traffic flow management things involving circles, which I think is the technical term. Yeah, like if, if you don't have them in your town, which is possible, we'll get to some USA stats at some point. Mm-hmm. But uh, you can think of it as a tiny little circular expressway with different exits Oh yeah, nice. all along the way. So as you approach one, if you want to go straight, if you want to just keep going straight, you have to enter the roundabout and go halfway around and then take your little exit to continue straight. If you want to take a left, then you have to drive all the way around the circle and then get off taking a right, if that makes sense. Yeah, this article says it's a 270-degree turn. Yeah, that that that, that uh, tracks, I think. I won't contest that. <laughs> uh all right, so I think we can do history now. Man, that was a really great description of a uh, roundabout, man. Which was the tiny exp- uh, circular expressway? Yeah. It yeah, like just, we have 285, you know. the perimeter here in Atlanta. Mm-hmm. Like a lot of cities have perimeters around the city. Uh-huh. And this is just like a tiny little perimeter. Yeah, yeah, I guess that's a really good way to put it. Thanks. <laughs> so um, if we're going back to the beginning of roundabouts, most people would expect to find them in Europe because everybody's seen National Lampoon's European Vacation (laughs) with the very famous roundabout scene, right? Yeah. Um, Actually, the first contours of what would become roundabouts are found in Washington, D.C. In Europe's defense, they were designed by a European, Pierre L'Enfant, who designed Washington, D.C. He actually worked in some traffic circles, which is weird because there was no such thing as cars at the end of the 18th century. Oh, yeah. So it's very odd that he worked traffic circles in, but by God, he worked in traffic circles. Well, there were horses and buggies. I imagine there was... I wonder if there was horse and buggy traffic, surely, right? 
I, I don't know. I'm not sure why he created these circles if it wasn't for traffic flow. <laughs> or if it wasn't just for aesthetics, it's possible it was for aesthetics too. Although it was probably some weirdo Mason thing that has to do with taking over the world uh, in five centuries from now or something. <laughs> I just think it's funny. I've never really thought about uh, in a big city like Washington, D.C. in the uh, 1800s, sitting in a long line of horse and buggy traffic, like, <laughs> oh, for God's sakes, this guy, this guy right. in front of me, he's sitting there writing a, writing a letter with a, with a fountain pen. <laughs> <laughs> right. Settle thee, Eustace, settle thee. <laughs> Get off your paper. <laughs> Get off your paper. <laughs> They'd have a quill is what it is. Yeah, what did I say, fountain pen? Yeah. No, you said ballpoint, I think. No, I said fountain pen. I'm pretty sure you said ballpoint. <laughs> we'll rewind and find out one day. Uh, so DuPont Circle, the very famous and beautiful, and I, I really like that area of D.C. Oh, yeah. Uh, DuPont Circle is uh, was, I believe, kind of the first big one in the United States, right? Yes. And so people say, okay, all right, whatever. Pierre L'Enfant designed one in Washington, D.C., and that's 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 it. That, that became the first one later on. But that doesn't really count because he wasn't really anticipating cars. So surely the first one really is in Europe, right? <laughs> and actually, no, that's not correct either. No, in 1905, Brian Eno. Oh wait, <laughs> not Brian Eno. His brother Bill. Yeah, Bill William Eno. Uh, in 1905, constructed. He was a businessman, and I don't think he constructed it, but he designed at least and implemented the very famous Columbus Circle in New York City, mm -hmm. which everyone as far as autom automobiles go, consider the first traffic circle in the United States. Yes. So definitively, the first traffic circle, the first circular means of directing traffic around a circle circularly. Four cars. Right. It finds its, its place in history in 1905 in New York City. And then the first one came f in, in the UK, at least, if not Europe, four years later, um, the British one-way gyratory uh, in <laughs> Letchworth Garden City. That's adorable. Letchworth Garden City. Doesn't that make you feel like everybody dresses like undertakers there? <laughs> yeah. And they, they have, like you know, like claw fingers or something? <laughs> Letchworth. <laughs> Welcome to Letchworth. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, okay. So, finally... Europe gets on board with the traffic circle in the early 20th century. Yeah, uh, we should point out, though, that with those earlier roundabouts, uh, they were not like we see today. They didn't have this gradual sort of flowy motion. It was sort of a circle with these sharp right angles where you enter and exit, which uh, is, is not flowy and intuitive. No, it's not. And there is this other thing, too. So... Um, if, if a roundabout, so you can kind of interchange roundabout and traffic circle and then something else called rotary. It's all a circle where traffic is meant to go basically one way around it and there's exits that are actually streets that form up the intersection, right? Yes. All of those things have that ele those elements in common. Where, what the differences between like rotaries and traffic circles and roundabouts is the rules, Right. So when they when traffic really started and people started building these, especially in America and the, in Europe, um, like in the 20s, 30s, 40s, when they really started to begin to take off, the rules were different and they had it dead wrong. And it was a really simple, a really simple traffic rule that they had going on that was screwing everything up. And what it was was that if you were in the traffic circle. If somebody was waiting to get in the traffic circle, you yielded to the person coming into the circle. It's just so backwards, Lit it's literally backwards. Totally backwards. They basically had a 50-50 chance of coming up with the right rule, and they chose the wrong way. And for decades, people got nightmare headaches from traffic circles, which back then were called rotaries. Yeah, they had uh, congestion. They had a lot of accidents. Mm-hmm. And this was in the, like, 1930s through the mid-1950s. For close to 30 years, they were just like, well, we just can't figure out what's wrong here. There's just something wrong, and I can't put my finger on it's it. It's crazy. And finally, in England, in 1966, they went, 
well, why don't we just reverse that and reverse the yield? Right. That's literally all they had to do was you – as you approach a traffic circle, you are yielding. Once you're in the traffic circle, you're fine. And yep. that changed everything. Changed everything. All of a sudden, like they had – they used to have to call in cops to undo the gridlock that would form in these traffic circles because of this. Um, and they changed this this flow of traffic pattern. The old one was called weave theory, where the people in the circle would stop and the people coming in would, would weave into whatever lane they wanted to. It was just madness. And then they went to gap theory, which is – you basically get in where you fit in when you're coming into the circle and everybody else in the circle is like, just get out of my way. I'm in the circle. I've got the right of way. And like you said, it changed everything. And all of a sudden, these um, like delays and congestion dropped by like half overnight. Yeah, capacity increased by 10%. Crashes and delays decreased by 40%. And everyone went, wow, I can't believe it took us 30 years to think of this. Yes, and it took off big time in, in Britain after that. Uh, but because of the uh, hullabaloo in the United States previously, mm-hmm. there was a long time where the U.S. was like another, you know, 20 plus years where the U.S. was still like, no, nah, I'm not I'm not falling for this traffic circle thing again. Yeah, because, I mean, they had built rotaries all over the place in the United States, but they they worked so poorly because of that one stupid rule that by the time... America gave up on it, and the time Britain picked up on that rule change, America had said, like, we're, we're done with these. They, are, they were actually tearing out their old rotaries and putting in um, new four, you know, four, uh, uh, like a, a traffic-lighted intersection. Like yeah, we, they, we they marched down of. with their pitchforks and their torches and stop signs, <laughs> and, they dis- and jackhammers destroyed these traffic circles. Yeah. And smash stop signs through human bodies into the ground. Yep. It took, I think in 1988 in Ojai, California, lovely Ojai, mm-hmm. uh, there was a proposal for just a little three-legged roundabout. <laughs> and everyone in Ojai's pretty laid-back area, they were like, no! Mm-hmm. And so they didn't do it. And then two years later, finally, in Summerlin, Nevada, uh, everybody, or I'm sorry, Nevada, everybody got on board and I think they had a couple of them in a planned community there. Well, that's why I think it went through is because the community was being built from the ground up. So there right. was nobody to say no. Oh, so they were just, they moved in and they were there. Exactly. Right. Yeah. All right. So, so that was 1990 when America got its first actual roundabout. And again, it's because of that one stupid rule that had just plagued everybody and driven them crazy starting in the the 30s up to about the 50s. And I saw one other reason why America didn't have roundabouts too, Chuck. Um, After World War II, when Eisenhower was over there, um, he saw a lot of gridlock in Paris, especially around the Place de de Toile gyratory, the one that's around the um, L'Arc de Triomphe, you know, which is huge. It's like a 12-lane traffic circle. And he saw it was gridlocked all the time. But then he saw in Germany how fast the Autobahn had gotten the Nazis around. So America got interstates instead of traffic circles because Eisenhower was basically the ar- architect of America's interstate system. Oh, wow. Mm-hmm. That was the other reason. I saw another thing. I was reading an article in, uh, I think, I can't remember where it was, but it was basically like why it might have been Priceonomics, why America has been so reticent. And there is another theory uh, that this one, and this is a bit, I don't know, they call it controversial. It's really not that big of a deal. But they say the roundabout (laughs) is said to have flourished in Britain Mm -hmm. because it requires the British virtues of compromise and cooperation. They said the U.S. is more aggressive and confrontational in culture and may explain why the roundabout has not been more widely adopted. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, it is a, a group cooperation moving through a roundabout for sure. Whereas with a traffic light, it's the traffic light says stop. The traffic light says go. And all you have to do is know whether you're allowed to, whether you have the right of way or not. To punch it. <laughs> right. And I actually saw there's a there's something called the UK Roundabout Appreciation Society. Oh, that's lovely. And the guy who runs that says that traffic lights are fascist because they tell you to stop or go at any given point in time, whereas a roundabout is much more group cooperative and people make their own decisions together as a a collective. 
Yeah, that's why it's weird that in Ojai they would uh, there was an outcry in the eighties. I guess they were just so new that, that they didn't get it. I think that's and I think that's ultimately why people don't like roundabouts. There, it's a new thing, and everybody was raised with their traffic lights, and they know what they're doing with traffic lights. Yeah. And this is a big, new, scary thing, and we're not in the mood to learn a new thing. So get that plan out of here <laughs> and give us a stupid, dumb traffic light that we're going to have to sit at at one in the morning, even though there's no one in sight, and lose our minds. And then you finally get sick of it and decide to run the light, and out of nowhere, there's a cop behind you. Yeah. All right, let's take a break. Okay. And uh, we'll, we'll talk more about roundabouts right after this. Okay, so we should talk a little bit about how to design a roundabout. If you have a neighborhood that you uh, have under your control, um, <laughs> maybe you're going to want to put a roundabout in after you listen to this episode. So if so, there are some, some things, some design principles that you want to follow. If you're the king of your neighborhood. Mm-hmm. <laughs> or the dictator. Sure, why not? Uh, apparently, according to our article, uh, there are five characteristics one of which I wouldn't even count as something you would need to, uh, well, I'll just say that the big dumb dumb one that should be assumed. I'm going to see if I can pick it out, okay? <laughs> All right. Uh, I, I bet you will. First, uh, you enter, uh, the entry is controlled by a yield sign. Okay, that's that's smart. But there are no signs or anything else you have to do while inside the circle. Right, inside the circle. use your turn signal. Yeah, that's the one thing you're supposed to do, but everything else is like Thunderdome, like no rules. <laughs> Actually, that's not true. There's plenty of rules. Plenty of rules. Uh, the second one is vehicles inside the roadway always have the right of way. That's a big one. Again, that's gap theory. You get in where you fit in if you're coming into the circle because everybody else in the circle already has the right of way. Did you make up get in where you fit in? I mean, I've heard it before, but oh, as okay. far as traffic circles go, yes. Oh, because that's a... That's a heck of a slogan. I think it's. I think that is probably what's going to lead America to a deep and abiding love of roundabouts. <laughs> I think so. We love things that rhyme. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> we're a dumb culture. Uh, third, pedestrians can only cross the legs of the intersection, uh, and you can only do it behind the yield sign. So does that make sense to people? Yeah, like you, you're not supposed to cross to the center island. No, that's – I have a little story about that, actually. The very famous Arc de Triomphe in Paris, France. That's the one I was talking about, the Place de Toile. Oh, okay. Is that what it's called? Yeah, that's the name of the traffic circle. Yeah, when I – the very first time I went to uh, Paris when I was, oh, I don't know, 22, 23 years old, mm-hmm. my friend uh, Brett and I were standing on the outside – Okay. Looking at the Arc de Triomphe mm-hmm. and all of that traffic, and how many lanes is that, did you say? Twelve. Okay, twelve. But there are no lines, right? It's just twelve space for 12 cars. <laughs> Think about that. Like, we don't even have 12-lane highways in the United States, as big as our highways are. Yeah. So we're standing there, and we're looking across, and we're looking at the traffic. We're like, man, I don't know about this. Uh, and then we see an elderly woman standing under the arch, <laughs> and I was like, dude, if she can get over there, we can get over there. Mm-hmm. And we did the Frogger <laughs> dash across the street, made it in one piece, and then realized that there's an underground walkway. I have the exact same story. Really? Yep. Yep. When I was there with my family, my sister and I tried to, we, we made it across, but didn't. <laughs> we're like, how is this legal? Why? Like, couldn't Paris have come up with a better way? Yeah. Yes, the answer is yes, and they did. <laughs> That's pretty funny. Yeah. I bet we're not alone as Americans. <laughs> no, I'm thinking that happens multiple times a day. Yeah. Uh, all right. So the fourth one is that uh, parking is not allowed within the circular roadway. I think this is – I'm going to go ahead and say that I think this is the dumb one. Yeah, that, that's the one. Has I anyone ever just stopped and been like – and like, all right, I'm going to the store? <laughs> Maybe. There's that. There's one they put a roundabout in at Lennox Mall. Do you know that? Mm, I don't think I've seen that one. 
Um, it has backed up traffic for miles. Like somehow, it, it, like the traffic backs up to Tennessee now because no one knows what to do there. Wow. They they do stop in the middle. I don't think anybody's parked in it to go into the mall, <laughs> but if they had, I wouldn't be all that surprised. Is it in the parking lot? It's um, it's or part the, of the road. It's in the parking lot, but huh. it's part of like the you know the road. You know what I'm saying? It's not like in there's not like a parking space on it or anything. Yeah, like yeah, that. yeah. To get to and from the mall on the mall property, there's a roundabout now. Gotcha, gotcha. Uh, and people do stop though, like. Just as the guy barreled in without yielding, I was also in a roundabout the other day where a lady, like, jammed on the brakes when she mm-hmm. saw a car approaching to get into the roundabout, and that mucks everything up, too. Right. That's the uh, weave theory that screwed things up with rotaries. You just you do not stop when you're in this, the roundabout. And I think this is what really freaks people out, is you realize that once you pull into that circle, you're expected to keep going. Like, that's just the way it is. You're not supposed to stop. Technically, you're not supposed to change lanes. And you're just, you're supposed to go, go, go. And I think that's probably what unsettles a lot of people about the roundabout. That and the fact that it's unfamiliar and new and it's not what they learned to drive on starting at age 16, you know? Yeah, and if you get freaked out, like if you're, I mean, the ones in Atlanta are all pretty small neighborhood ones. (laughs) Just single lanes and you're going super slow. But if you get in a large one and you get freaked out and you don't get how to get over or, or get in the off the exit, j- just keep circling. Calm down because <laughs> yeah. you can keep driving in a circle just like European vacation, mm-hmm. Big Ben Parliament. Just keep hugging the circle until everybody leaves and then you can do what you want. Yeah, until 2 in the morning and everyone's mm-hmm. gone. Uh, and then finally, the fifth characteristic is all traffic must pass to the right of the central island in a counterclockwise direction. Yeah, that's a big one. And and it it depends on where you are and what traffic circle it is, but in the United States, traffic circles and roundabouts typically go counterclockwise like you just said, right? Yeah. There are some out there that that go clockwise, depends on again on where you are. The point is is all traffic is going in the same direction around the circle. I think there's a couple out there that of course are going to um, undermine what I said. Yeah. There's always somebody who's going to. <laughs> but um, traffic circles typically all flow in the same direction. Yes. So what we're talking about is sort of the standard. There are many different kinds. We'll go over here in a sec. Mm-hmm. But the standard one is just a circle around a central island. Most of the times there's something lovely in that island. Right. A planting or a statue or something. Which is a, another reason why people like roundabouts more. Sure. Yet stop signs never planted. Or in the middle of a fountain? No. There's just some person wandering there in the middle of the intersection, <laughs> you know? Yeah, and someone has put a uh, a sticker over the stop sign that says Trump. <laughs> <laughs> or logging or animal abuse or whatever. Right. Oh, I get those. I get it now. Stop whatever. I gotcha. Have you never understood that? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> okay. It, I think I do remember it taking me longer than it should have, though, and this is the first time I've ever really admitted it. Yeah, and yield signs don't uh you wouldn't be prone to yield to a yield to logging. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone yield to logging. Um well the logging industry they might put those up. That would never take off though because it doesn't rhyme. No, oh, you're right. Mhm. Um so they have many roundabouts that are uh you know 40 50 feet in diameter and then what they call rural roundabouts uh, which are very large, and the only the reason they're large is because it's rural and you can go a little faster. Mm-hmm. That's the thing. Like if the smaller the radius of the roundabout, the the slower you have to go around it. Yeah. Which is one reason why in Atlanta there's so many of those ones just in the middle of the neighborhood, mm-hmm. rather than a speed bump. There's a nice little lovely fountain just smack dab in the middle of the road. Or maybe it's a tree or something like that. And it's a barrier, an impediment that you're being forced to go around so you can't go very fast, right? Yeah. With with a traffic circle, um, that is one of the main goals of any traffic circle is to slow you down and to direct you safely to where you're going at a slightly slower rate of speed. Um, But depending on the radius of the circle you can go a lot faster on on the bigger ones. And there's some I saw that are up to like 100 meters across or 300 feet. 
which is basically like a football field. That's oh, an wow. enormous traffic circle. Yeah. On something like that, you can just haul. Haul butt? I guess. <laughs> uh, I live uh, near Memorial Drive mm-hmm. at a very dangerous intersection where Memorial Drive kind of in the neighborhoods where I live is dangerous anyway because it is a 35-mile-an-hour street, supposedly, that's three lanes that people go about 60 on. Yeah, and there's a lot of hills and, like, blind— um, A lot inter- of blind, blind hills. Blind uh, streets, side streets or whatever. Yeah, and it's one of those that has the reversible— like, it has a— Oh, yeah. It has a sign above that either has an, a green uh, arrow or a red X— for that center lane. So depending on the time of day. Or the lane's mood. Yeah, or the lane's mood, it will switch. And we have, we probably have eight to ten serious, serious accidents at the intersection near my house a year. Really scary ones. And so they are, they're not doing roundabouts. I wish they would, but they are doing a what's called a road diet. Have you ever heard of that? No. That's when you actually lessen the, uh, you shrink, not in size, but you... What's the word I'm looking for? <laughs> I, I don't know. They're basically shrinking the travel lanes to make it safer. So they're, that middle lane is going to be a turn lane now mm-hmm. and not a reversible traffic lane. So there gotcha. will only be one lane of traffic going each way with the turn lane with the idea that that is less confusing. It slows things down, supposedly, and gets people that are turning out of the way. Yeah, a reversible lane is just a bad idea, yeah. especially on Memorial. It's not a 35-mile-an-hour road. No, Atlanta has two very notable in that area, uh, Memorial Drive and, and DeKalb Avenue, that are both – people drive way too fast on these roads, and they are mm-hmm. both uh, have these reversible lanes. Yeah. So – I wish they would do a big roundabout right near my house, but they'll, they'd never go for that. Yeah, I actually um, just barely escaped death once on DeKalb Avenue because I hadn't noticed that the lane was reversible. And I took a left in front of a guy in the reversible lane next to me and just he just stopped just in time. I had no idea that he was there because I didn't realize the lane was reversible. Yeah. It was, man, even just thinking about it now, I get the shivers. <laughs> see? I see the uh, yeah. chicken skin. They're like quills. All right, so there are more uh, types of than the, just the regular roundabout, and they are as follows. Uh, to me, I couldn't tell a difference in the dog bone and the dumbbell. I got this. Really? Because they mm-hmm. look just the same to me. Did they? You looked them up and they looked the same, huh? I thought so. Okay. But that just may be the internet messing with me. Could be. So like a dog bone one is two traffic circles... And But it's one contiguous road going around both of them and connecting the two, okay? So it's like you go around one circle and then you go on a little bit of a straightaway and then suddenly you're in the next circle and you go around that circle and you're back onto the other side of the straightaway and then you're back onto the other circle, right? That's a dog bone one. Just imagine what a dog bone looks like. Yeah, from the sky. A dumbbell, sure. <laughs> a dumbbell uh, traffic circle is... A traffic circle and another traffic circle, and they're two distinct ones, and they're connected in the middle by a roadway, like a dumbbell. So it's not one contiguous road, even though it kind of is. It's it's much more of like a right turn when you get into one circle or out of one circle to get to that main road. How about this, everybody? Go look up a dog bone (laughs) traffic circle and a dumbbell traffic circle, and you'll say, "Ah, okay. The way that this article put it is the the dog bone traffic circle, it looks like you took a big traffic circle and pinched it in the middle. And then the, the like, two circles form on the outer edge, and it's kind of flattened in the middle of the two. I think that's a pretty good description. Again, just go look up pictures <laughs> of them. Yeah, if you're listening now, pull your car over, though. Oh, good point. Put and, your phone down. Yeah. Uh, the hamburger roundabout is... Just like a regular roundabout, but the main road there crosses the center island. So Mm -hmm. if you want to go straight, you can just go straight. If you accidentally, uh, let's say, get in the roundabout, you can still exit and go like you were going straight on that main road, though. So you have two options, basically. Yeah. If you want to go straight. And then from what I saw, if you're that that road, the hamburger line road that goes straight through the circle is the one with the right of way. And everything, everybody else getting into the circle and 
um, going around the circle has to yield to that that road going right through. It seems okay. It seems a little much. Like you've you've taken roundabout design too far if you've made a hamburger. <laughs> this is my opinion. Uh, yeah, agreed. So there's a flower one too, Chuck, which is pretty. Yeah, it doesn't mean the flowers in the in the center circle, although they are often there. But this is where you have a regular traditional roundabout. Mm-hmm. But the right hand turns are there's another little little slip road outside the roundabout. It's called a slip lane, mm-hmm. and I think that just I don't know maybe that makes it a little easier. Yeah, so if you're actually entering the traffic circle, that means you're either going straight, turning left, or making a U-turn. If you're doing right turns, you're just directed right. You don't ever make it quite to the traffic circle. It's just like, here, take your right, go over there. Yeah. And, I mean, at the very least, it, it would um, cut down on congestion. Um, and probably be, it would, because there's fewer people entering the traffic circle, it would just cut down on accidents altogether. Yeah. Um, and then another one's turbo, a turbo roundabout, which is basically like a flower roundabout. But the thing is, it's um, it's multiple lanes, but you have to choose what lane you want to be in depending on what you want to do. If you want to take a right turn, you get in the far right lane. If you want to go straight, you have to get in the, um, the middle lane. If mm-hmm. you want to turn left, you get in the left lane. And depending on, on what you're doing, it will direct you around the traffic circle to where you want to go. But the, the reason you have to choose a lane is because once you're in it, you can't move. Like there may be a curb or there's some flowers or something like that. And these are supposedly way safer. I saw something like 50% fewer accidents. Oh, yeah? They, they, yeah, they allow for more um, cars. They make you um, think about what you're doing a lot more, so you tend to go into them a little slower, even though it's called the turbo roundabout. Um, and the reason why there's fewer accidents is there are fewer conflict points, right? Yes. Did we, did we talk about conflict points yet? No, not yet. So if you enter an intersection, a, four way, a four-way intersection with a traffic light, there's actually 32 of what are called conflict points. And they're basically 32 places that you could possibly get into an accident. And some of them can be really bad, like a, uh, a T-bone, right, where you turn left in front of an oncoming car and it hits you right in the middle. Man, those are bad. They are bad. I got turned over once, uh, hanging upside down in my car. Uh, oh, good Lord. From getting T-bone. Yeah, seatbelts, man. Um, and then there, you could also get a head-on collision. Those are particularly bad, too. Those don't exist in traffic circles. It's not possible for you to get T-boned or to get into a head-on collision in a traffic circle, right? There's actually only eight conflict points in a traffic circle rather than 32. So that automatically means there's going to be fewer accidents. And then with a turbo um, traffic circle, they have fewer conflict points. I didn't see where. Um, But I think because of them and the flower ones that they direct right-hand turns outside of the circle, um, it probably cuts it by half maybe even the number of conflict points. Right. Uh, And we're talking about cars here. Pedestrians and and cyclists also figure in. uh, And like we said before, pedestrians, they usually have a crosswalk on the legs behind those yield signs Mm -hmm. and some kind of – they call it a landscaping buffer, something sort of there – to intuitively keep you out of that intersection and directed toward where you should cross. If you're a cyclist, uh, you have a choice. You can either get off your bike and then act like you're uh, just a walking pedestrian and go that way, or you can get in that traffic circle and they should treat you like a car. And they they suggest that you ride kind of in the middle of it so cars aren't uh, incentivized to try and go around you. Yeah, ride in the middle of the lane. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because a car going around a cyclist in a traffic circle, that's that's probably a recipe for uh, accident. For sure, dude. And then um, did you say that pedestrians are the, actually the ones in a traffic circle who have the right-of-way above everybody else? No, I didn't, I didn't say the right-of-way, but pedestrians always have the right-of-way on, or should have the right-of-way uh, on roads in America, but, I mean, not like expressways, obviously. But, uh, you you know, be smart. You still just don't go, like, running through there saying, I've got the right of way. <laughs> right. If you hit me, you're in trouble. It's your fault. You want to take another break? Let's do. All 
All right, dude. So there are some real benefits to roundabouts. One of the things we already talked about is that they're safer. Just by by definition, they have fewer con- conflict points. So with fewer places that you possibly can get into an accident, there's going to be fewer accidents. Um, and I've seen a lot of different statistics. There's some old statistics. There's one. There was a study from 2000 that looked at 24 new roundabouts in the U.S. and found that there was a 76% decrease in crashes that resulted in injuries and a 90% decrease in crashes that were fatal or incapacitating. And then there was a, a, about a 40% reduction in crashes overall. Yeah, that's, that's, those are big numbers. That's enormous. Um, and they, they seem to be held up. Like, I've seen different studies that have slightly different numbers, but they're all definitely in that same ballpark. And they all amount to the fact that traffic circles are just way, way safer than intersections with lights. Just ridiculously safer. Again, it's impossible to get into a head-on collision, and it's impossible to get T-boned, and those are the two most dangerous kinds of accidents you can get into. Yeah, they're also cheaper um, over time. It's To build a roundabout, it costs about the same, roughly, depending on you know the size, obviously, mm-hmm. as a regular uh, like traffic-lighted intersection or traffic-lit. But these traffic lights over time cost a lot more to maintain, um, about five to ten thousand dollars a year in maintenance uh, over that's, their life of fifteen to twenty years. I would think that's how much like a, a traffic light cost, and then that was it. That's an en- enormous amount of of money. Yeah, well, these are this is government money, though. <laughs> I guess that's, I wonder if that's for all all the lights in an in intersection. That can't be per light, right? I don't know, man. Yeah, prob. I don't know. Who knows? But yeah, that's a lot. And that's the thing with traffic circles. You don't have lights. You got four yield signs on the outside legs and everything else is basically just paying somebody to keep the the grass cut and the flowers watered in the center island. Yeah. Maybe some paint on the road. That's it. And eventually, you know, they said about 25 years, you might need to do some reconstruction on the roundabout from... uh, from dummies hopping the curb and stuff like that. Oh yeah, that's over time. I couldn't think of why. I'm like, you're really wearing your your roundabout out if it only lasts 25 years. But yes, of course, people do hit the curb, and especially apparently, 18 um, wheeler drivers yeah. are not particularly big fans of roundabouts because no. if the radius is really tight, they're they they just can't navigate it. So some roundabout designs have included an apron, which is basically like a curved curb that you're not supposed to drive on, but if you're an 18-wheeler, it's just a little extra bit of room that you can get through the traffic circle with. Yeah. Um, what else is there? Oh, I know another benefit. They're green. I love this one. They are green, man, and I hadn't thought about it. But when you stop at an intersection, come to a complete stop, especially if you're sitting there idling at a stupid red light, <laughs> you're just sitting there burning gas. And then you burn a lot of gas to go from a complete standstill up to accelerate to the, the normal speed again, too. You don't have that in a traffic circle, or you have a lot less of it, because people can just go right into the circle if they're getting in where they're fitting in America. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, there are some uh, numbers around that. It... it uh it reduces delays depending on the roundabout anywhere from 13 to 90 percent. And this improved flow reduces fuel consumption and emissions by about 30 percent or more. Yeah, I saw 28 percent less gas used from a study uh, back in 2002. Again, an old study, but I didn't see anything newer than that. Should we talk about some tips? Yes, this is this is the public service segment of this this episode, Chuck, and I really feel like we can do some real good here. Yeah, I mean, we've kind of covered some of these, but if you don't know about how to navigate a roundabout, you approach it. As you approach it, take a deep breath, Mm -hmm. relax. You can do this. It's no big deal. (laughs) And you're going to see that diamond-shaped, or it's actually not diamond-shaped. It's it's an upside-down triangle, right? It's two triangles put bottom to bottom, butt to butt. Backside to backside. Are they? They're not diamond shaped, are they? Yeah, yeah. It's like a, a yield triangle. signs are just triangles. No, these aren't yield signs. Oh, this is a this is a, this is a roundabout sign. That's oh, like a, a beware of approaching roundabout. 
Yeah, it's it's oh, okay. basically like a, a quick graphic that's like basically a, a yeah. rough map of the roundabout you're dealing with. It'll yeah, show yeah. the number of legs, the okay. suggested speed, all that. Gotcha, gotcha. So take a look at that so you know what you're about to go into. The, our, our article is so dumb. It says <laughs> it has a suggested speed, usually around 20 or 30 miles per hour. It, don't just default to that. It, you know, look at the suggested speed if there is one mm-hmm. or just slow down. It's pretty intuitive of how fast people are going. I feel so bad for pumps right now. For what? Pumps. Clint Pumphrey. Oh, yeah. He wrote this one. I thought it was pretty good. No, it is good. But there's a couple of things he should clean up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the counterintuitive thing, we we definitely disagreed with that. All right, so slow down to that speed. Look for people. Look for bikes in the crosswalks. And again, if there's somebody in that crosswalk, you stop because they got the right of way. Yeah, but so you yield to them. But if it's clear, you go to that yield sign. You look left to see if anyone's coming. Mm -hmm. And if no one's coming, you ease into that traffic circle. Mm -hmm. Uh, Ideally, you don't have to stop at all. But if there's cars there, of course you do. Mm -hmm. Uh, But if not, you just keep that flow going and go around that circle as many times as you need to feel comfortable exiting the circle. Right. And when you're in there, don't stop. No. Do not stop while you're in the traffic circle. Again, if you're freaked out, just drive around the circle and hum to yourself. Give yourself a little, like, mini lobotomy, right? And then when you're comfortable, do your thing. But remember, you still need to use your um, your signals, right? So if you're taking a right at that first leg, it's going to be pretty quick and painless. You just stay in the right lane and you go around and you turn right. You turn your right, sing, right signal on and, and make a right-hand turn. Yes. It gets a little more complicated if you're going straight. But really, it's not. Because if you stop and think about it, all you're doing is swerving around an island and going back into the the path that you were on before. Yeah. Then there are multiple lane roundabouts. I have – I don't think I've ever been in one of those. Oh, yeah. I don't think I have. There's – I mean, it's it's, it's a little more complex, but it's – it's really not. And the key to those are you just don't change lanes. You pick the lane you need to be in, and once you're in it, you don't change lanes. Right. And and it's just it's just two lanes going in the same direction together. So if you're gonna go if you're gonna turn left, you already wanna be in the left lane of the two lanes, and you're going to go into the inner lane of the traffic circle, right? Yeah. And then when you take that left turn, what you're really doing for, as far as the circle's concerned is taking a right, but let's not confuse things further. When you take that left turn or make that left onto that left leg, you're staying in that, that lane. There's going to be a lane for you to go into that whole time. So you just stay in your lane and go to where you want to go, and everything is totally fine. It's, right. it's not that much more complicated for a two-lane one. Nah, not really. Just, uh, you know, be careful with all this stuff. Don't go barreling in there. Uh, If you're not, you know, even if you do feel comfortable with your own self, not everyone else is. Yeah, that's a big one to remember. So just remember, even though you've slowing down maybe more than you want to, it's still better than stopping in a stoplight. Yeah, and I have to say also, like, it would not hurt to go watch, like, a two-minute video on how to navigate a roundabout. Like, there's, it's not hard, but it's a lot easier to see it with like some video than it is to hear somebody describing it, you know? Yeah, for sure. So I we got to talk about a couple of like roundabout things in pop culture, okay? Yeah, there's let's, actually, let's do it. We already talked about European vacation. Right, but there's actually a dude who holds a record for the, um, I guess, the longest time driven on a single roundabout. Oh, really? Yeah, a guy named Oren Sands from Carmel, Indiana, which... As far as I can tell, Carmel, Indiana, has 60 roundabouts, which is more than any other city in the United States. Yeah. How many did you say? 60. Carmel, dude, now has 105. Wow, man. They've gone bonkers. <laughs> With 100, that was as of July of last year, and they have 140 proposed. Wow. It's the roundabout capital of, of the United States. Well, they also have, I mean, that's appropriate because they have the roundabout king, Oren Sands, who on October 3rd, 2015, drove his 1987 Volkswagen Cabriolet around a dog bone roundabout in Carmel for three hours, 34 minutes, (laughs) and 33.24 seconds, which set a record only because it must have been the first time anybody's ever done that. Wow. 
<laughs> was he just one of those guys that's not comfortable, so he just kept going? Or was he, he out to set a record? He out to set a record. He he was out to set a record, but it all started because he was um he got distracted once and ended up having to go around the a dog bone um roundabout and decided, you know what, I'm gonna just set a record here. So uh-huh. he did. He's that kind of guy in that kind of town. <laughs> Uh, I got some stats for you okay. as far as the United States go. Uh, American drivers on average pass through uh, 1,118 intersections before you encounter a roundabout. Uh, and in France, you were more than 25 times more likely mm-hmm. to go through a roundabout than the States. Uh, also very big in Germany, uh, obviously Great Britain, Spain, Australia. Uh, and in fact, Australia... I think it's second to France. You mm-hmm. go through one roundabout every 65 intersections. Yeah, I saw that Australia's roundabout crazy, too. Uh, and as far as the U.S. goes, the state of Florida has the most, although the state of Maryland has the highest concentration oh, yeah, okay. of roundabouts. So in Maryland, I believe it's uh, you're likely to pass through one once every 363. Mm-hmm. And South Dakota is the least likely state Number 50. Um, and I guess, I mean, there's no one in South Dakota. You don't need roundabouts. <laughs> it makes sense. <laughs> yeah. But it's uh, on average once every 22,806 intersections, <laughs> which I think means there's only one roundabout. <laughs> I think so. It's right in the middle of a wagon trail. Yeah. And we, you know, we got to talk about Swindon. Yes, we do. So Swindon has something that's Actually, the actual name of it is the Magic Roundabout. Uh, It was originally called County Islands Ring Junction, but it's so nuts that they renamed it Magic Roundabout, and that was a nod to a kid's show that was very popular in Europe in the 60s and 70s. Yeah, Swindon, obviously, in England, if you're a fan of the original uh, BBC office, uh, then you know about Swindon. It takes a lot of guff on that show. It's sort of a running joke. Okay, so just setting the stage. <laughs> is that where is that where the the uh, British office was set? No, but they take on very early in the uh, in the in the show. They take on uh, workers from the Swindon branch that had closed, mm-hmm. and there I don't know what the inside joke is, but there are just a lot of little barbs uh, kind of thrown at Swindon throughout gotcha. the show. Yeah, I could see that. Yeah, uh, who knows? I, I've never really watched the British version. Oh, man, it's so good. Uh, the American version is pretty great, too. Is They're it, is, both great. It's one yeah. of those rare cases where they just nailed it in both nice. both countries. Nice. So in Swindon, Swindon's big claim to fame is that they have that, that magic roundabout. So get this. The magic roundabout is five clockwise roundabouts. Mini roundabouts. That form a circle mm-hmm. outside a an internal big roundabout that goes counterclockwise. Well, no, inside and external, wouldn't it be? They're contained In- within the outer one. Oh, okay. I thought it was that they were they were around the outside of an inner one. So there's an outer one that goes that that the the five are inside. That makes way more sense. Yeah, like the, just go to wired.com and there's mm-hmm. an article called The Brilliant Sorcery of England's Seven Circle Magic and they have a uh, a little a moving graphic of how this thing works. And it will, as an American, and maybe even as a European, it will break your brain. As a human being. Yeah. It, when you look at this thing, when it shows how everything works in motion mm-hmm. with different color arrows going around, mm-hmm. you're just like it looks like chaos, but apparently it, it works. I wouldn't want to, I mean, you got to really know what you're doing, but if you do know what you're doing, it works. I saw over a 25-year period. Again, and so so what I'm seeing here is that there are five five of these roundabouts all connected. There's an inner clo- anti-clockwise roundabout and an outer clockwise roundabout. So it's technically seven roundabouts all forming one giant circle. Yeah. That's what I'm seeing. Um, but despite all this, in 25 years, they've only had 14 serious accidents and about 100 lesser accidents in 25 years. Yeah, and I think a lot of those involved uh, bicyclists. Mm-hmm. And now they have solved that, they think, because there is now a cycle lane yeah. on the outside of the whole thing with something called the Pelican Crossing. I don't know what that is. Do you? Yes, I looked it up. I'm like, that doesn't make any sense. It's called a... Um, 
pedestrian light controlled crossing. It's kind of like a terrible acronym, but it's you know when like you're you want to cross rather than wait for like the light to change, you mm-hmm. can press the button and the light comes on and everybody has to stop. Yeah, that's a pelican crossing. Oh, okay, so it's, they think that solves. The, what little, you know, problem they had with accidents. Yeah, it's pretty impressive, man. I think one of the other reasons is there's not more accidents is, is people who don't know what they're doing just stay out. Yeah. You know? For just sure. rent a helicopter. Why not? You got anything else? I got nothing else. I, I like this one. This, is to me, is one of my favorite kind of Stuff You Should Know episodes. Civil engineering ones, traffic ones, what? Nah, just sort of like ballpoint pens, like a very rudimentary thing that's actually – Brilliant in its simplicity and yeah. has a unique history. I love this stuff. Yep. Well, uh, if you want to know more about traffic circles and roundabouts, go watch some videos. They're actually kind of mesmerizing. Uh, and you will learn to be a better driver as a result. And maybe none of us will ever have to wait at a red light again, ever. Uh, and since I said that, it's time for listener mail. Oh, no, it's not. Oh, what is the time <laughs> for then? Well, I didn't get one. So when occasionally that happens. Okay. Not to say I didn't get any email, I just did not prepare one. I see, I see. Uh, but sometimes when that happens, we will do this. We will uh, encourage the sharing of stuff you should know. Oh, yeah. Tell some friends. Tell one person you know. Tell, tell two. Tell two people that you know <laughs> how much you love the show. Uh, if you have not left a rating or a review on iTunes, that helps us out. We encourage you to do that. Yeah, and anywhere you can leave a a rating or a review for us would be great. Absolutely. So uh, we don't do this much, but we appreciate the support, and we encourage you to help spread the good word of this little show that's been around forever. Oh, yeah, and and we should say also, too, Chuck, another way to spread the word is to go to our merch store at tpublic.com slash stuff you should know, and you could buy shirts that are pretty straightforward stuff you should know stuff and then some really arcane ones that are basically like (laughs) one-off joke references that sometimes even me and chuck are like wait what does this mean yeah but but they're good like the lewis the child skeptic shirt which i love sure we got uh great band name shirts we got wayback machine shirts yeah don't yuck someone's yum yeah we have the standard stuff you should know logo and uh all kinds of shirts and coffee mugs and that we're finally doing merch right and uh, have a good little store going yeah so there's a lot of ways to show your love for us but the biggest way of all is to just say hi once in a while and say hey dudes i like to hear what you guys have to do that makes us feel like a million bucks and you can do that by going to our website stuffyoushouldknow.com and finding all of our social links there and you can also drop us a line by email at stuffpodcast at howstuffworks.com For more on this and thousands of other topics, visit HowStuffWorks.com.